A very warm welcome to the Booms and Bus Show. Good morning, good evening and good afternoon. My name is Santa Claus and it is the 1st of April 2019. This is very strange. I think I'm right in saying this is the 77th Booms and Busts show uh, being podcast and I haven't actually done one for a month. Um, I was meant to do one a fortnight ago, but uh, I was absolutely up to here. And uh, and then the next week, um, I was up in Scotland um, um, on client uh, meetings. And, um, I, and, and then I came back, of course, uh, at the end of the week. And then by the time last Monday came, when I normally record... I was up to here with emails and work that needed to get done. So it's been three weeks. It's been pretty hectic, um, I can tell you. Absolutely delighted to be back in this chair. It does feel actually a little bit strange. It's funny when you stop doing something, you get out of habit, um, how strange it can feel. But a warm welcome uh, and thank you for the lovely comments that uh, you've sent me by email and um, on Twitter at Booms Busts Show. Um, looking forward to the next broadcast. Well, you're listening to it. Um, please do tweet me there at Booms Busts Show. Um, follow me if you're not following, um, or indeed check that you are following, because I'm not joking. I have a strong suspicion that because the number of followers on Twitter hasn't changed, barring literally a handful or two, in literally months, um, I'm, I'm quite convinced that Twitter are actually um, unilaterally um, taking people away from following me, and they don't know it, and, and they're, until they suddenly wonder, why am I not seeing the tweets of the Booms Bus Show? Well, I'm convinced that is what's happening. Um, do also please um, l see the tweet of this show. Retweet it. It takes you one second to retweet. Um, spread the word about the show. Otherwise, others won't get to know what you know. We need to tell as many people as possible about free markets, about independence, about liberty and freedom. Because I tell you, as I've said before, people are running into a tunnel out of which they will never get. Also, if you are a listener, a regular listener of this show, then you need to be also receiving the Booms and Busts report which is due out probably this week. If you're not on the list, just send me your full name and your email address. Uh, I guarantee to you, you will never be junk mailed because your email address will never leave this office. Remember that the easiest ways to get the Booms and Busts podcast is simply to go on to audioboom.com, click listen, Search for Booms and you'll see on the list Booms and Busts. Click on it and click to subscribe. That way it will automatically be sent to you every time I publish a new show. I want to start off with climate change. And I have a tremendous chart here pushed out by a scientist one of the co-founders of Greenpeace, and it shows that um, the temperature globally has been rising since, it's hard to tell, about 1650 or 1700. In other words, one to two centuries before the Industrial Revolution. Climate change is not man-made. 30,000 scientists agree climate change is not man-made. 
It's just like Project Fear and Brexit. It's a stuff of nonsense. It's something that the party of Davos, the global elite, want people to believe. Now, millions of, if not tens or even hundreds of millions of smartphone users confess their most intimate secrets to mobile apps, including when they want to work on their belly fat, the price of the house that they had a look at last weekend, and so, and so on. Of course, where are they looking? Um, if they use Uber or Lyft, where are they uh, traveling to? Um, if they use Just Eat, what are they buying? And so on. Other apps know users' body weight, blood pressure, menstrual cycles, pregnancy status, etc. Unbeknown to most people, in the vast majority of app cases, that data is shared with someone else. Facebook Inc. If I were you, I would delete your Facebook account. It is the unacceptable face of capitalism. So, so much, of course, has happened in the last month since I presented a Booms and Bust show. And uh, it's hard to tell what's the most important. But let's start off with... Um, a, a investigator Mueller a, in Washington was going after Trump to see whether or not there was any collusion with the Russians. And of course, his report comes out and says, Niet. <laughs> now, this happened um, about a week or 10 days ago. And Steve Bannon who is an absolute god. He's an amazing guy. Um, I think I'm right in saying he used to run Breitbart and then he became um, uh, Trump's chief of staff and essentially led him politically to becoming president of the United States, winning the 2016 election. I've seen a snippet of an interview with Bannon and he says that now that that is clear, Trump is now going to drain the swamp. He is actively going to go for the Washington acolytes, the CIA, the FBI, the media, and he is going to get them. He's going to take them down. And for us conservatives, it is going to be a thing of beauty to watch. Watch this space. Two years of investigation, $50 million, <laughs> I'm sure, and the rest, that's what they've uh, admitted to, spent thousands of um, state personnel on this investigation and you and I knew from the off that it was a stuff of nonsense. Did you know that prior to 2016 election, Russia donated over $145 million to the Clinton Foundation? And I'm sure it's a coincidence, but Hillary Clinton sold... Um, 20% of America's uranium production to under Vladimir Putin's um, auspices. It does make you think how utterly disgusting Washington politics is. As far as I'm concerned, lock her up is still clear and present. And, you know, they investigated uh, Trump for doing nothing. They didn't investigate Clinton for deleting 33,000 
official emails uh, and literally destroying PCs and drives. And if that's not an obstruction to justice, I don't know what is. Lock her up. For how many years has female genital mutilation been on the statute book as a criminal offence, but without one single successful prosecution, despite hospitals reporting increased occurrence in the thousand. Well, on February the 1st, uh, at UK Home Office is the handle, tweeted this. Today, a mother of a three-year-old girl has become the first person in the UK to be found guilty of female genital mutilation, FGM. Contact the at NSBCC anonymously on 0800 028 if you're worried that a girl or young woman is at risk or is a victim of FGM. Hashtag end FGM. They were so proud they caught one out of how many thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of cases reported to them. They caught one. They are disgusting. Theresa May was the Home Secretary. Sa- Savid Javid is now the Home Secretary. They've caught one. Savid Javid clearly desperately wants to be the next Prime Minister. Um, he's saying they're going to increase stop and search. Yeah. Ha- ha- um, you, uh, you couldn't have done that already, Mr. Javid. You're dead right, you could. But I know, of course, you're, you're, you're quite comfortable seeing young men and women stabbed to death in their dozens and hundreds. But when there's a chance of getting a promotion, then you change your stance. My goodness, politicians. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about uh, Westminster in a couple of minutes. It doesn't seem possible, but they say it's true. A team of Israeli scientists is telling the world that they will have the first, quote, complete cure, unquote, for cancer within a year. The Jerusalem Post reported, and not only that, but they claim it will be brief, cheap and effective and will have no or minimal side effects. This is Star Trek stuff. Dan Arador, chairman of the board of Accelerated Evolution Biotechnologies Limited, AEBI, said, We believe we will offer in a year's time a complete cure for cancer. Unquote. AEBI is a company founded in 2000 in the ETEC incubator in the Kiryat Weizmann Science Park in Ness Zionav, just north of the Weizmann Institute of Science in Rehovot. AEBI is a development stage biopharmaceutical company engaged in discovery and development of therapeutic peptides. AEBI developed the SOAP platform, a combinatorial biology screening platform technology, which provides functional leads to very difficult targets. Functional leads, agonist, antagonist, inhibitors, etc. Well, my goodness me, what a step forward in the human race would it be if they could eradicate all cancers? Um, Some of you will know um, what it's like to live in a world without polio, um, largely without rabies. And, you know, 
uh, 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 even the common cold. Remember the flu, uh, uh, 19, the Spanish flu in 1918. It killed, what was it? I mean, I'm being, am I being silly here? A hundred million people or something ridiculous? Just the flu. Well, um, smallpox eradicated um, some of the many, many reasons, apart from the fact, of course, of extraordinary development of uh, prosperity and longevity of life due to free market capitalism and technology. How amazing it would be if we eradicated um, cancers. Of course, it would be absolutely incredible. The, 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 the wealth um, left over from the amount of spending that we put into, cure, into helping people with cancer, just think of the amount of money that could be saved. Now, of course, in the public sector, they'll just put the money to something else, but just think of the incredible savings, the incredible dividend, financially, never mind health, well-being, that the world would get if they eradicated cancer. I don't know if it's a myth. I don't know if they're pushing their share price, but I'm telling you, you uh, 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 they're a listed company. You cannot make claims like that um, without being under the very watchful eye of the stock market regulators. So, it's the 1st of April. You know I'm not really Santa Claus, don't you? Okay, just checking. Ho, ho, ho. Down, Prancer. 26th of March. The EU's censorious copyright directive will create two internets. The European Parliament's approval of the copyright directive is the end of the internet as we know it. Last week, folks. This new regulation creates substantial new controls on what we can share online, which threaten freedom of expression, undermines creativity, and cements the dominance of technology giants. Anyone mention Facebook? The copyright directive will create two internets. The first a heavily censored version for European users, including filters to prevent us from uploading content. The second, a free internet where creativity is encouraged for everyone else. Now, I'm not sure, but this could affect the very existence of the Booms and Bust podcast. To be discussed. The directive represents everything that's wrong with the EU's policy-making process. It was written at a substantial distance from Europeans, heavily influenced by lobbyists, national compromises. There is a serious lack of accountability. So what's new? The internet was supposed to democratise access to information, and it did. The Parliament's new article will decrease access to online news. It will be much simpler for most websites to block links than go through the effort and expense of reaching licensed deals. In 2014, Google shut down Google News in Spain to avoid legal liability in response to a similar domestic law. It wasn't worth operating a free service that brings in little revenue at the cost of paying for links. While this will all be an expensive pain, Article 13 is a gift to the largest platforms in some ways. Only the largest companies will be able to afford to comply with the legislation by creating automated copyright assessment and licensing with owners. Newer and smaller platforms will not be able to compete. This locks in place the largest companies. But then, a day later, there was a twist to this story, making it even more insidious, if that were possible. It has emerged that many MEPs were, quote, 
tricked, unquote, into voting the wrong way. An extra vote was inserted into the voting list at the last minute, which threw most MEPs' voting lists out of sync. MEPs just robotically pressed buttons according to a long voting list handed out to them. At least 13 MEPs have told the European Parliament they accidentally voted the wrong way. Now the EU has modified their individual voting records, but get this, has refused to revisit the result of the vote, despite the fact there was a majority of just five MEPs. The EU also rejected a direct request from MEPs to stage the entire vote again. This blocked MEPs from voting on any amendments, including on the meme banning Article 13. Now the internet killing law has been passed, the EU simply don't care. Diane Abbott said, quote, We are not interested in reforming the police, armed services, judiciary and monarchy. This is the shadow home secretary, remember. We're about dismantling them and replacing them with our own machinery of class rule, unquote. Now, I don't know about you, but I remember class being talked a lot, a, a lot in TV programs and movies up to the early 1970s. And then you hardly heard about class. You didn't hear about the class war until the last few years when it's the socialists or the hard socialists, not that soft socialism means anything particularly better. It's the momentum types, the Corbynistas, who have been bringing class back in. You know, I'll never forget um, watching a, a, an old newsreel or, or, or something of, a, of an interview that um, the, the, the 1960s um, rocker, um, um, blonde guy, he, he, he played Budgie in the TV series. Um, what's his name? Adam Faith. I'll never forget, because it was so striking, the Oxbridge educated um, with incredible privilege um, interviewer on the BBC actually asking this pop star if he thought it was right that a working class man should earn £10,000 in a week. Yes, the BBC hasn't changed its disdain for the working class in all the decades. Talking of which, I was at the Leave Means Leave uh, demonstration um, uh, in, in, uh, in Westminster, in Parliamentary Square, on Friday afternoon. You had uh, some wonderful speakers um, Embury, who's a trade unionist. I've, I've never understood how a socialist can be for freedom. Yeah, I, I literally don't get that. Um, Farage was there. Um, Hoey was there. Um, Peter Bone. Um, the wonderful Marc Francois. Um, and uh, on another stage, um, maybe not as much as... but perhaps 100 yards away, uh, Tommy was doing his thing um, earlier on. Um, it, it was a wonderful, wonderful occasion, um, except, of course, it should have been because the 29th of March was when we were meant to be leaving the European, European Union. Um, however, um, we plod on, and uh, um, at the moment we're looking at the 12th of April, um, 
No doubt uh, if Theresa May is still in charge, she will put her withdrawal agreement forward for the fourth time. Um, it lost by 230 votes, then it lost by 150 votes. Uh, on Friday afternoon, uh, while I was having my lunch uh, in Westminster, um, it lost by 60 votes. So no doubt her crowd are thinking, well, we're getting close, lads. Um, we can go from 230 to 150 to 60. Maybe we can crack it on the fourth attempt. But of course, the reality is that um, some of the leavers who voted for it, I suspect will actually vote against it the next time. Because uh, there's word that the whips were telling them and the Tories that uh, it's going to be very, very close. We need your vote. And, of course, it was a pack of lies. Well, of course it was. Um, it, was a, it was a great event. Um, I wonder if you were there. If you were, I mean, let, let's uh, talk about it on Twitter. Um, in the evening, um, I then went um, a couple hundred yards away to Church Hall, and uh, we had the most fantastic or I attended, should I say, the most fantastic uh, meeting of, get this, Frexiteers. Literally, hundreds of French folk came over at their own expense because they are Frexiteers. And initially, of course, they wanted to celebrate with us. But however, they came to support us. And um, I, I was deeply proud to be able to speak to them um, for a few minutes. Um, when uh, I have a copy of my bit, then I will, of course, tweet it. But I think the most poignant thing that I said in my speech was that we voted to leave, we being the UK, and thus far the powers that be, the media, the politicians, uh, the big businesses, a.k.a. the bankers, the party of Davos, have succeeded in defying and likely reversing the democratic vote. I then went on to say that speaker after speaker, and, and there had been oh, probably six, seven speakers before me, including um, an ex-defence minister, um, Kate Hoey, um, Gerald Howarth, who was Maggie's PPS, um, uh, as well as um, Gerald, um, I can't remember his name, he, he's the, the, the head of Labour Leave, can't quite remember his name, um, on, and they all said... We will leave. Well, I said to the throng, and I pointed to these people, speaker after speaker has have all said, we will leave. Well, so far, they're wrong. I hope that they're proved right. But that's the point. We haven't left. Um, the spirit is strong, no doubt, in leavers. But... Um, uh, Leavers uh, had a very very bad campaign. I I I, I tell you, I tell you, um, they're they're saying to us that those who voted for May's thing on Friday, well, the option is either May's thing or no leave. Uh, yeah, well, that is absolutely utterly stupid because May's thing is no leave. Surely there's another option. And the other option is that the ERG goes on strike. And as the my hero, Keith Baker MP, has been saying on television today and in the press over the weekend, um, he would be prepared to vote against the government. Rightly so. He'd be voting for the country and for democracy. Whereas Jacob Rees-Mogg and Boris Johnson put party before democracy. Utterly disgusting. But it was an absolutely superb 
uh, Frexit Tears event. The spirit in the hall, and I'm telling you, in this hall there were, uh, well, uh, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 people. It was absolutely tremendous. Um, they broke into song often. Um, they they broke into chanting often. Oh, it was just sensational, the enthusiasm, the spirit. Um, and, of course, it was deadly serious as well. Did you even know that there was a group of Frexiteers? Well, they are. And, they, and in terms of membership, they are the third largest party in France. At the last general election, they got 1% of the vote. I can guarantee to you it'll be closer to 10% next time. So, even France. 1st of April. It's been a long time since I last did a podcast. On March the 11th, we remembered the victims in 2014 of the Madrid bombing attack when Al-Qaeda terrorists took responsibility, interesting word, for the murder of 191 Spanish innocent civilians. And then we see this nonsense in uh, Christchurch, New Zealand. It's not nonsense that um, dozens of people were murdered. That's, of course, disgusting. And uh, they should lock, lock him up and throw away the key. Literally never let him out alive. But that the world went into shock and anger over um, Islamophobia when in the same period or same week or so 150 Christians globally were murdered notably in the Philippines and I think it was in uh, it was in Nigeria not a peep from the politicians not a peep from the media. Of course, I didn't actually say um, where are we now or going with regards to Brexit. Um, I've been saying since January, as you know, that um, I really didn't believe that we were going to Brexit on the 29th of March. Um, unfortunately, I've been proved right. Well, um, it's hardly a shocker, is it? Uh, legally, we are leaving deal or no deal on the 12th of April. Well, you know as well as I do that that is not going to happen. Um, Theresa May will have something else up her sleeve. We know that over a half of Tory MPs, including members, ministers and members of the cabinet, um, have given her a letter, signed a letter saying um, we must leave on the 12th, even if it means no deal. And uh, and she is very, very weak. She has very little support uh, in Cabinet. They can't get rid of her. They can't have another vote of no confidence in the party for 12 months since the last one, which I think was December, I think it was. Um, serves them right, the, uh, the leavers who voted for her. They were so proud of themselves. Um, the only way she can go is if she will resign. Um, so it's unlikely she's going to do that. Um, and of course, uh, the European heads of state are going to meet again on the 10th of April. Um, that will be interesting because I can't actually see them giving an extension. Be, um, um, well, maybe they give an extension um, to Article 50 to the 22nd of May. Yes, they might give an extension to that. Yeah, I can imagine that happening, actually. Um, come to think of it, I don't know why I hadn't thought that before. Um, and, uh, yeah, and then we'll plod on to the 22nd of May. 23rd of May is uh, uh, European Parliament elections, and uh, the Europeans, the EUs, they definitely do not want the United Kingdom involve, involved in the 2019 MEP elections. They don't want it to happen. Um. On the final point about uh, Brexit, um, 
Uh, uh, everyone, of course, adores Nigel Farage, blah, blah, blah. He's achieved a great deal. No question. A hugely successful politician. But uh, Nigel, for goodness sake, you have split the Brexit vote. UKIP is nowhere to be seen in the polls. And when they bring in the Brexit party into the polls, um, the two of you will split in two. So, Nigel, I, I beg you not to stand against UKIP um, candidates um, across the country, whether it be local elections, regional elections, or indeed a general election. Um, come to agreement that you will not stand against each other, Gerard and Nigel because otherwise it'll be an absolute disaster. And uh, Nigel, on your head be it, on your personal head be it, if we don't get this through, it will now be because of you. You have split the vote. You know what you have to do. Economics. Um... U.S. hourly earnings up 3.4% year-on-year. That's the biggest percentage increase since 2010. That's nearly a decade. Inflation is ticking up. We also saw um, first, uh, sorry, February employment numbers only 20,000 new jobs created in America for February. The estimate was 180,000. Shock horror. America must be going into recession. No, because January was the biggest increase in jobs in years at 311,000. In other words, some of those, many of those that would have been hired in February were hired in January. So overall, 330,000 over the two months. What's that? 165,000 a month. Um, it's not great, but it's not bad as it happens. Uh, and certainly, we now have the longest period of jobs increase in America, get this, it's now getting on for nine years. The second longest period of expansion was five years. That's the difference we're talking about. That's how strong things are. The unemployment rate is at 3.8%. Um, all things are basically okay. Now, some of you who are a bit, little bit knowledgeable will be shouting at your listening device right now and you'll be saying, yes, but troughs in the unemployment rate have then set off um, uh, slowdowns as the unemployment rate ticked up. Except for one thing. Firstly, um... It's always, there's always been a material time lag of one or two years between the trough and in job numbers, the percentage rate of unemployment and a recession. And so we're still, on that basis, we've still got one or two years. And secondly, similarly, we've got to see unemployment rising. We're not seeing it rising. So even though all these people are flooding into America, they're getting jobs exactly the same as Britain. Talking about Britain, you know that uh, I've been forecasting uh, house prices to fall. In London, they are falling at the fastest pace in a decade. Uh, they're down 4% year on year in London, according to the Nationwide They've been negative consistently in London since the summer of 2017, nearly two years. Prices have been falling in London. 
the Manhattan luxury home market is brutal. And that's where the stock market's still up in the clouds. Total luxury sales for, for 2019 is just 229 homes. That is 19% down on the same period in 2018. And that was 15% down on 2017. So Manhattan is down heavily. Australia is down heavily. China is down heavily. Most of Canada is down heavily. Even San Francisco and California is down heavily. Do not tell me it's got anything to do with Brexit that house prices in London are falling. What's that countrywide? What's that that you say? The largest estate agent in the country? Countrywide has warned that Brexit will hit its performance in 2019. The group lost, get this, £218 million in 2018. £218 million. The chief executive Peter Long said, we encountered market weakness in quarter four. I didn't know he came from Darset. Due to the further uncertainty surrounding Brexit, which is affecting both our sector and consumer confidence as a whole. Brexit's got nothing to do with it, you idiot. Or you scam, you salesman, you. And on top, earlier this week, the firm was hit with a £215,000 fine by the HMRC for money laundering failures. The company was fined for failing to ensure that its money laundering procedures and record keeping were in line with regulations. Ah, uh, how, how else are they going to take suitcases full of cash f from Russian Merc 500s with guys dressed in black with black uh, dark sunglasses uh, to buy a palace uh, in uh, the top part of London? Well, of course... That's why the money laundering procedures um, were not necessarily in line with regulations. And it also must be why their share price and that of Foxton's has been crashing since 2014. We never heard the word Brexit in 2014 or 15. Estate agencies are in dire difficulty, listener, whether they are large or small. Take my word for it. Uh, yes, they've been kept up by rentals, but you know what? The rent fee ban comes into force this year. That will divert landlords from using estate agents to doing it themselves. This will reduce e -income, EA incomes further. What do you say to an ex-estate agent? Yes, I'll have large fries. Thank you. What do you know about the yield curve? We've talked about it before. The yield curve is, in essence, um, uh, on an X and Y chart, the interest rates over different time periods, say three months, one year, two year, five year, 10 year, 20, 30, that um, a government borrows money you'd normally expect that the three-month interest rate would be materially lower than the 10-year. Um, if you assume inflation, then you'd want a higher rate of interest for lending to the government for a longer period. Um, the financial world is um, in um, a, a massive state. They're going crazy because we've got yield curve inversion, which means that instead of, think of an X and Y axis, um, instead of the interest rates going from bottom left to top right, in other words, a rising curve, um, as you get a longer, uh, along the X axis, which is time, as you get longer and longer in the length of the loan, the interest rate gets higher. An inverted yield curve is where the short-term rate is higher than the long-term rate, so you're going from top left to bottom right. 
clearly if you have an inverted yield curve by the way this is a podcast you can go back to that and listen to it again if you get an inverted yield curve then that suggests we're getting lower inflation or deflation in the future in other words recession so the financial world saying we've got a yield curve inversion oh my god we're going to go into recession because they've been looking at the three-month rate relative to the 10-year rate and it's true of course what they don't tell you is that nobody cares about the 10-year to three-month everybody looks at the 10-year to two-year and the 10-year to two-year is not inverted 10-year rate remains higher than two-year and by the way if we do get an inverted yield curve where the 10-year is lower than the two-year it's still going to be somewhere between nine months and say uh, 21 months traditionally in our experience before you actually get a recession so um, don't let the bears drag you down because that's what they've been doing for years talking of which Hands up those who know who Stacey Herbert is. She is the wife of Max Kaiser, who has been doing, they've been doing the Kaiser Report for the last X years, I don't know, 10, 12, 14 years or so, on Russia today. I used to be an avid watcher until I realized the guy um, and uh, Stacey were just media prostitutes. All they cared about was... Uh, audience numbers and their payments from Russia today they didn't give a damn about actually giving quality serious education to their ill-educated brackets of markets close brackets followers listeners and viewers these they, they were pushing gold while gold was falling for five years for example, they were pushing Bitcoin at 16,000, 17,000, 18,000, 19,000. They were pushing it. Buy, buy, buy. You'll be absolutely stupid. You'll hate yourself if you don't buy Bitcoin. And he was pushing Bitcoin when it went down. 15,000, 10,000, 5,000. He and Stacy were pushing it all the way. Now, just yesterday, 31st of March, Stacy tweeted, we have an inverted yield curve. Um, she was so pleased with herself. She thought, finally, the bears are right. Bearing in mind, for the last nine years, the bears have been wrong. Nine years. Uh, and, and I simply went back with, but the 10-year to 2-year is not inverted. She came back to me with some comment about the time it takes to invert and whatever. And I went back to her with some facts about the economy, which is going to grow um, this year, and markets, which remain bullish. And then I continued a thread of um, openly stating, I have serious issues about media folk who have been leading um, ill-educated people to both invest in bad assets and divest of good assets. And before I'd even finished the thread, you know, we're talking about a maximum, I would say, of two minutes, she blocked me without discussion or debate. And... You know, it shocked me, but it didn't surprise me in the slightest. Because this is what media prostitutes do. They don't know what the hell they're talking about. They're often lying through their teeth. All they care about is subscriptions, about bums on seats, about audience. They don't care about you. I care about you Please stop reading these people, listening to these people, watching them. Stop it. 
They're costing you money and they're taking up your precious time, which you will never get back. Today, the BBC tells us that uh, minimum wage wages rise and bills go up too. What a shocker. Workers above 25 on the national living wage will receive a 4.9% wage rise. Younger workers will get a smaller percentage rise. But costs are up. Council tax going up more than inflation. Gas, electricity prices going up around £120 a year. The TV licence fee is going up. NHS prescription charges in England are going up. Water bills, vehicle tax rates, they're all rising. Public sector pay cap ends on the 5th of April 2019, this week. It's inflation, listener. I've been telling you about it for the last two years. And what does inflation also bring with it? You got it. You mouthed it. I saw you mouthing it. Higher interest rates. Yes, my forecast of a 17% fall in London house prices um, from 2017 still stands. Stock markets. The world index in dollar is up nearly 12% in the quarter just ended. It's the biggest quarterly gain since the third quarter of 2010. And the Kaisers and the Schiffs and the Zero Hedges, you read them, stop blooming reading them. They've been telling you stocks are in a bear market. Nothing could be further from the truth. Your old mucker here, JD, has been telling you to invest in stocks. British Petroleum, underlying replacement cost profits have risen over the three months ended December 65% compared to last year. Royal Dutch Shell for 2018, the whole year, Profits up 36% to get this $21 billion, the highest since 2014. European can cannabis market grew more in 2018 than it did in the prior six years combined. From Brendan Kennedy, the C CEO of Tilray, we see increasing global demand. When I joined the cannabis sector in 2010, medical cannabis was legal in 15 countries. Today, more than 35 countries and um, it will be more than 60 within three years. You're investing in cannabis stocks? Stocks over a $2 billion market cap. There are 1,800 of them. A third of them are up 20 more, 20% year to date. The S&P 500 is up over 10% for the year. And uh, the other years when that happened since World War II, there's five of them. The final 10 months of the year, the stock market rose 22%, 13%. It fell 13%, up 7%, up 10%. For goodness sake, what are you doing? Emerging markets, Goldman Sachs is looking at an increase in the Chinese market of 50%. Emerging markets are just going from strength to strength. They had an awful 2018. They had an amazing 2016 and 17. As far as I'm concerned, the bull market resumed um, in October, November of last year. Gold, it seems to me, it's on its way. Are you invested in gold miners in particular, small gold miners? Because I can tell you, we are. We are very much. Some quotes in the last uh, couple of minutes. If you drive a car, I'll tax the street. 
If you try to sit, I'll tax your seat. If you get too cold, I'll tax the heat. If you take a walk, I'll tax your feet. Have you got it yet, listener? Don't ask me what I want it for if you don't want to pay some more because I'm the tax man. Yeah, I'm the tax man. Now my advice for those who die, declare the pennies on your eyes because I'm the tax man. Yeah, I'm the tax man and you're working for no one but me, the Beatles. When anyone tells you how awful capitalism is, I really, really want you to remember this. Your life is infinitely better than that of the father of Queen Victoria. Winston Churchill said, When I was 20, I cared what everyone thought about me. When I was 40, I didn't give a damn what anyone thought of me. Now that I'm 60, I realise that no one was thinking about me at all. Similarly, from Oscar Wilde, When I was young, I thought that money was the most important thing in life. Now that I am old, I know that it is. Okay, a couple of political ones to end on. The beginning of political wisdom is the realisation that despite everything you've always been taught, the government is not really on your side. Indeed, it is out to get you. Robert Higgs The most dangerous man to any government is the man who is able to think things out for himself. Almost inevitably, he comes to the conclusion that the government he lives under is dishonest, insane and intolerable from Mencken. And on that note, listener, I am delighted to be back. My name, in case you didn't get it, is Roger Daltrey. I've had an absolute blast. I'll see you again next time.